Hi everyone. If you um, sorry to interrupt your book buying. Um, hello, we are back. Um, so, the next section is uh, sort of folkloric and paranormal monsters, not generally associated with the British Isles, uh, werewolves and vampires, but that may be about to change. Or it might not, I don't know. Um, but uh, so, firstly, speaking on Old Stinker, um, Wolves in the Wold, the English Eerie, and the weird case of Old Stinker, the Hull werewolf. Uh, to you, please welcome Dr. Sam George. Uh, Sam's book is at the back there, the um, Open Graves, Open Minds. Sorry, I'm not looking at it, and that's not what it's called, but I'm really sorry. If you could say it properly, because you're a grown up. Uh, please welcome Dr. Sam George on uh, Old Stinker the Werewolf. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm um, just going to uh, mention the project before I start on werewolves. So I'm here representing the Open Graves Open Minds project, which is based at the University of Hertfordshire. We've been going for about 10 years now. And we began um, thinking about, obviously, vampires, then moved on to werewolves. And now, generally, we extend to all narratives of the fantastic, the folkloric, the fabulous, and the magical. Um, so do, do follow up the project if you can. Okay, so I'm going to begin talking about wolves in the wild. So this research on the UK werewolf departs from earlier opinions of those who accounted for the di disappearance of the werewolf in folklore as owing to the extinction of the wolf. I argue instead that British folklore is unique in representing a history of werewolf hauntings in places in Britain where there were once wolves. I draw on theories of the English era um, and the turbulence of England in the era of late capitalism in my analysis of the representation of werewolves in contemporary urban myth. My account of the werewolf departs from psychoanalytic studies which tie it to repression and the beast within and I posit instead a theory that's rooted in landscape and absence in the present, taking inspiration from Mark Fisher's The Weird and the Eerie which he published in uh, 2016, I think it was. Um, Fisher argues that the eerie is found at the edges of genres as a mode of film and fiction, of perception and being. A sense of the eerie seldom clings to enclosed and inhabited domestic spaces. So we find the eerie more readily in landscapes partially emptied of the human. I extend this absence in the landscape to include vanished species such as the wolf. Fisher defines the weird in contrast to the eerie in a particular kind of unsettlement, something that should not exist in the here and now, and involving a sense of wrongness. However, he withholds this from the werewolf, arguing instead that the very generic recognisability of creatures such as vampires and werewolves disqualify them from provoking any sensation of weirdness. Obviously, I, I'm going to disagree with this. Um, werewolves, then, are deliberately excluded from uh, Fisher's notion of the weird because they conform to particular law. It's kind of saying that they behave in a, in a manner that we expect of them, therefore they're not weird. Um, my focus on the werewolf as spectre wolf contradicts this and brings the creature within the realms of the weird and the eerie. So the whole point of this really is to say, yes, they are weird. Um, the eerie coincides with a phase of severe environmental damage. In England, this has not taken the form of a sudden catastrophe, but rather a slow grinding away of species, such as the native wolf. The result is a landscape constituted more actively by what is missing than what is present, a spectred rather than a sceptred isle. This is the climate in which the spectre of old stinker, the whole werewolf, has emerged, rising from the ashes of the flesh and blood wolf. In 1865, Sabine Baring-Gould argued that English folklore is singularly barren of werewolf stories, the reason being that wolves had been extirpated from England under the Anglo-Saxon kings and therefore ceased to be objects of dread to the people. The Dictionary of English Folklore similarly informs us there are no werewolf tales in English folklore, presumably because wolves had been extinct here for centuries. 
These long-standing assumptions make the present-day sightings of the English werewolf known as Old, Old Stinker all the more unusual and prescient. What is most pertinent about this latest folk panic is that Old Stinker is thought to inhabit a landscape which accommodated some of the last wolves in England. The emergence of the English werewolf Old Stinker in Hull in the present has raised questions about the spectre werewolf's relationship to the flesh and blood wolf. So I want to talk primarily about this relationship. But first, it's necessary to look briefly at the history of the wolf in relation to the werewolf. In 1589, um, we saw the rise of werewolf trials appear. Um, this seems to have been the werewolf's Annus Maribolus in uh, 1589, because there's so much werewolf activity. Uh, Peter Stubb was executed as a werewolf in Cologne in Germany in that year. And of course, there were werewolf trials in France, which occur between 1598 and 1603. Um, it's very interesting, this, because most people have heard of witchcraft trials, but not, not so many people have heard of werewolf trials, that people were actually tried and executed as werewolves. All of those put to death for being werewolves at this time were murderers with a taste for human flesh. Sabine Baring Gould tells us the story of uh, Granier, a werewolf boy, who supposedly fell on and devoured several children. The boy was said to have appeared to his victims in wolf form. Belief in sorcery is key to understanding such accounts. According to Baring Gould, his explanation of werewolfism endured until the early 20th century. And Montague Summers posited a shared history of witches um, and werewolves, shown through his, his use of demonologies in The Werewolf in Law and Legend. So we're reminded that James's demonology, used widely in witchcraft trials, acknowledges the existence of man-wolves. British witchcraft trials focused on the witch's metamorphosis into hair or cat, as we've been hearing, um, paralleling the preoccupation with shape-shifting in European werewolf trials. Summers perpetuates his association between witches and werewolves in the 20th century by documenting the hierarchical sources, sorry, I meant to say the historical sources, and the authorities on shape-shifting witches in England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland and by appending material on witch ointments to his study of the werewolf. So there is a kind of connection here between um, witches and werewolves. Ointments and salves and enchanted girdles are evidence of magical explanations for voluntary human-to-wolf transformation in Sabine Baring Gould and Montague Summers' accounts. This notion of sorcery coexists with the belief in lycanthropy as a punishment, a judgment of the gods, a curse, a sign of bestiality, or at worst, of cannibalism. Sabine Baring Gould defines lycanthropy in 1865 in both magical and cannibalistic terms before turning to the notion of insanity. Truly, it consists in a form of madness, such as may be found in most asylums. Summers further medicalises the condition, defining lycanthropy in 1933 as that mania or disease when the patient imagines himself to be a wolf. Lycanthropy then supposedly existed in the mind. It had undergone a dissociation from magic, coming to represent the beast within, or everything animal that we have repressed in terms of our human nature. Freud was instrumental in rejecting sorcery, though he remained interested in early demonologies. He went on to write about the latent symbolism of wolves, associating them with a primal scene of psychosexual development in his case history of the Wolfman in 1914. So this history of werewolfism is important because I want to depart from these well-worn theories. I will argue instead that the history of werewolfism is inextricably bound up with humankind's treatment of wolves. A popular pamphlet, a discourse declaring the damnable life and death of one Peter Stubb, a most wicked sorcerer, who in the likeness of a wolf committed many murders, um, corresponds with the extinction of the wolf in England in the 1500s. Peter Stubb, the werewolf of Bedburg, whose story is retold here, is a seminal case. He was executed as a werewolf in 1589. Following Stubb's execution, a likeness of a wolf was framed in wood and set above a pole which contained this, his severed head. 
The pole was placed through the wheel on which he had been tortured as a permanent monument to both the killing of the werewolf and the destruction of the wolf. English monarchs had a large part to play in the eradication of the British wolf. King Edgar was the first monarch to set about cleansing and ridding the country of these ravenous creatures. It was thought that that within four years of his campaign, no wolves would remain in Wales or England. Dead wolves were coveted as trophies in Anglo-Saxon Britain, and Edgar demanded that his Welsh subjects pay him 300 wolf skins a year. Some criminals were encouraged to pay their debts in wolf tongues. English wolves were almost totally eradicated under the reign of Henry VII. Wolves held out in Ireland until the 1700s, though they were extinct in Scotland by the late 1600s. British and Irish wolves were exterminated much earlier than wolves across Europe, the, complex extinct, sorry, the complete extinction of which did not occur until the 1800s. There are um, one or two sympathetic accounts of The Last Wolf by Jim Crumley and others, but otherwise there's been little sympathy around the persecution, slaughter and extinction of British wolves uh, due to the way these animals are perceived. Gary Marvin, for example, documents what he calls lupophobia in a history of humankind's hatred and fear of the wolf. Even in the 20th century, wolves had been had few defenders and continued to be much maligned. Montague Summers, for example, is notably devoid of sympathy for the wolf, arguing for the creature's unbridled cruelty, bestial ferocity and ravaging hunger. His strength, his cunning, his speed were regarded as abnormal, almost eerie qualities. He had something of the demon of hell. His is the symbol of night and winter, of stress and storm the dark and mysterious harbinger of death. Despite this demonising of the wolf, Summers reminds us that all, of all British animals that have become extinct within historic memory, the wolf was the last to disappear. This is significant because whilst very few accounts of werewolfism in England and Scotland exist, I have uncovered instead a history of literature on hauntings or spectres in landscapes where there were once wolves. I'll just explain a little more about this. In 1912, Elliot O'Donnell, Irish author and ghost hunter, described wolf phantoms in remote parts of Britain. The first was in North Wales, where a Miss um, Dennis witnessed a nude grey thing, not unlike a man in body, but with a wolf's head, in lonely farmland. Um, she subsequently learned that in one of the one of the quarries close to the place where the phantom had vanished, some curious bones, partly human and partly animal, had been unearthed. O'Donnell concluded that what he had seen, sorry, what she had seen might very well have been the, earth, the earthbound spirit of a werewolf. Similar incidents occur in Cumbria and in the Valley of Dunes in Exmoor, where the tall grey figure of a man with a wolf's head is believed by the observer to be the spirit of one of those werewolves, who were still earthbound owing to their incorrigible ferocity. Elsewhere in the Hebrides, a human skeleton with a wolf's head is unearthed in a tarn by a geologist. This causes the monster to appear in spirit form at the window later in the evening, before the bones are reinterred and the werewolf is laid to rest. Montague Summers recounts a similar story, only this time it's an Oxford professor in Wales, who discovers the ancient skull of a large dog in a lake and takes it to his abode, whereupon the hideous face of a wolf with the eyes of a man appears to his wife at the window. The creature is eventually chased back to the lake and the skull is returned to the water. Summers argues that this is evidence of the phantom werewolf, whose power for evil and ability to materialise in some degree were seemingly energised by the recovery of the skull. Such watery hauntings, absences and phantoms are features of the eerie that are notably repeated in descriptions of old Stinker, the whole werewolf, to which I now turn. In 2015, newspapers reported on the whole werewolf, old Stinker, or the beast of Barnston Drain. He was terrorising women with his human face and very, very, very bad breath, um, hence his name. 
The sightings were reported in the popular press again in 2016, so we've got some headlines here. Woman says she ran from the whole werewolf old stinker. Woman met eight-foot werewolf old stinker with human face and extremely bad breath. Um, and it goes on like this. Um, there has been something of a folk panic in Yorkshire following the sightings of, of this eight-foot werewolf living in the walls. And a myth has grown up that old stinker inhabits a landscape that is thought to have had some of the last wolves um, in the UK. And newspapers have since reported a full-scale werewolf hunt. Old Stink has apparently eaten a German shepherd dog and has been seen leaping over fences like a modern-day spring-heeled jack. This very English werewolf can be found in descriptions of Yorkshire's weird walds, existing as local or particularised knowledge. Travelogues or tourist accounts describe the Yorkshire walds as a relatively small crescent of rolling chalky countryside, arching from glorious Filey with its miles of golden beaches in the north to bustling Hessel, home of the world-famous Humber Bridge in the south. The Yorkshire Wald Way is a 79-mile national trail and extends through the east riding of Yorkshire and Ryedale, featuring the widest of wide open spaces. The Yorkshire Walds is apparently the perfect place for anyone looking to escape the rat race, or a dog-eat-dog -dog world, perhaps. I've got more sightings of Old Stinker here, but I'm just going to move on to... Um, oh, I got stuck here. Well, there we go. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, so the world's many myths and legends are unmatched. According to um, Charles Christian, they include vampires, green-skinned fairy folk, headless ghosts, screaming skulls, a black skeleton, a parking-eating dragon... <laughs> Sea serpents, turkeys galore, England's oldest buildings, enchanted wells, and of course, werewolves. Christian is the author of a travel guide to Yorkshire's weird walls. He has identified what he terms the walled Newton Triangle. This is, this is Yorkshire's version of the Bermuda Triangle, I have to say. An uncanny region where most of these beasts and sightings can be located. Speaking of the landscape that inspired his work, he informs us that part of the country was once infested with wolves. Up until the 18th century, there was still a wolf bounty for anyone killing them. It was known for the wolves to dig up the corpses from graveyards. From that sprung the idea that they were supernatural beings who took the form of werewolves. There is a legend of a werewolf called Old Stinker, a great hairy beast with red eyes, who was so called because he, because he had bad breath. When I was a child, I remember some, someone saying... They would not drive along the road from Flixton to Bridlington after dark because of those fears. What Christian presents as personal memoir has an affinity with what Emma McElroy would, would term gothic tourism. Such edutainment relies on a community of taste. It plays to those who already know, um, those who are possessed of a knowledge of a specific body of text, their conventions, narratives and tropes. The knowledge or body of text that inform Christian's writing make up what I term, following the definition of Mark Fisher and Robert McFarlane and others, the English eerie. Christian succeeds in drawing attention to the dark side of the landscape, a place where kings built hospices to protect weary travellers from wolves, and reinventing the werewolf myth. The wolves, we are told, were regarded with particular loathing because they scavenged in graveyards for freshly buried corpses. And this is not all. Their habitat of suddenly descending in large packs on areas where they'd previously been unknown gave rise to the belief that they were not ordinary wolves, but human beings who adopted a wolf-like shape by night. The key to understanding this myth is a place called Spittle Ho, where Christian claims, which Christian claims is associated with an ancient charter dating back to about 939, this is the time of King Edgar. This declared that a hostel be built to, produce, to protect wayfarers from the wolves' ravenous wolves. The wolf shelter was supposedly restored in 1447 so that people could continue to be safe from being devoured by wolves. The Yorkshire wolds were seemingly infested with wolves, which would come down from the hills to attack not only flocks of sheep, but shepherds, who protected them. 
Old Stinker, then, is associated with one of the last strongholds of British wolves, who the landscape he inhabits. He's originally found near Flixton and Knothull, one of the few historical exceptions to the no werewolves, please, we're British rule. Old Stinker previously made an appearance in the 1960s and is linked to an ancient wolf-like creature. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, walking upright and having a particularly long and powerful tail, almost as long as its body, that it used to knock to its victims to the floor with. After this, sightings of the English werewolf disappear, only for him to reappear again in the 21st century. Hull is also 35 miles from Flixton, and the myth of Old Stinker was subsequently transferred to Hull when Christian informed journalists of the story following newspaper coverage of the Beast of Barnston Drain. This eventually led to a full-scale werewolf hunt on the 21st of May in 2016. The crew did not come face-to-face to face with Old Stinker. Christian began to link the werewolf to Black Shuck, the ghostly dog that is thought to haunt eastern England. But the myth of Old Stinker endured and has continued to enjoy attention in the British media. The story or the myth of Old Stinker, the spectre werewolf in the Weird Walls, is a powerful example of English eerie. Robert McFarlane has defined the English eerie as the skull beneath the skin of the English countryside. This is more than supernaturalism, it's a cultural and political response to contemporary crises and fears. Writers such as M.R. James exemplify the English eerie because, they, because of their understanding of landscape as constituted by uncanny forces, part buried memories and contested knowledge. Landscape in James is never there to offer picturesque consolations. Rather, it's a realm that troubles. He repeatedly invokes the pastoral only to traumatise it. James's influence has rarely been more strongly felt than now. For as Christian's text shows, there is across what might broadly be called landscape culture a fascination with these Jamesian ideas of unsettlement and displacement. Mark Fisher and Robert McFarlane have defined the English eerie, which for such descriptions of old stinker exemplify. So and basically I want to kind of tie these things together. The eerie is located, as I have said, like the story of Old Stinky himself, within a spectred rather than a sceptred isle. For landscape theorists writing on the English countryside, such concerns are not new, but there is a distinctive intensity and variety to their contemporary address. This eerie counterculture, this occuculture, is drawing on, drawing on exper experimental filmmakers, folk singers, folklorists, academics, avant-garde antiquaries, queries, landscape theories, utopias, uh, and collective and mainstream um, academics, interests, people with all kinds of interests, arch druids, you could, you could go on and listing these people. It's a magnificent mashup of hauntology, geology, science, and political, political activism. In music, literature, and film, and photography, as well as in new and hybrid forms um, and media. The English eerie is on the rise. A loose but substantial body of work is emerging that explores the English landscape in terms of its anomalies rather than its certainties or continuities, that is sceptical of comfortable notions of dwelling and belonging and of the packaging of the past as heritage. The contemporary eerie feeds off earlier counterparts. Um, so there's a renewed interest in uh, Robert Hardy's 2013 print of The Wicker Man, for example, and The Witchfinder General, which you heard about earlier. Um, films whose landscapes reveal an underlying sense of psychotic breakdown and brutal violence rather than invoking an English idyll. The eerie has grown to incorporate a huge variety of genres, silent Scandinavian cinema, public information films, the music of Ghost Box Records, and the writings of M.R. James, uh, Susie Cooper, and Arthur Macken. Adam Scovell defines this genre in relation to mostly British landscape as the evil under the soil, the terror in the backwoods of a forgotten lane, and the ghosts that haunt stones and patches of dark, lonely water, 
a subgenre that is growing with newer examples summoned almost yearly. There's an element of folk horror here then, a term popularised by Mark Gatiss in 2010, to refer to films which shared a common obsessive um, idea of the British landscape, its folklore and superstitions. This has since been expanded by Adam Scavell in 2017 to define a work which uses folklore either aesthetically or thematically to imbue itself with a sense of the arcane for eerie, uncanny or horrific purposes. Also influential is the 2014 reissue of Alfred Watkins's cult classic uh, of landscape mysticism, The Old Straight Track. I think I actually saw a copy of that at the back there. <laughs> um, it's this work which popularised the idea of ley lines, a supposed alignment of many places of historical and geographical interest, such as ancient monuments, um, ridges and so on, which mark very old track, trackways, often believed to be used for ceremonial or mystical purposes. This notion still has the ability to re-enchant the landscape for writers. It would be easy to dismiss such writing as an excess of dark mysticism or an unnecessary eruption of Gothic tourism, but engaging with the eerie emphatically doesn't mean believing in ghosts or spectres. What it, what's underway across a broad spectrum of culture is an attempt to account for the turbulence of England in the era of late capitalism. The supernatural and paranormal have always been means of figuring powers that cannot otherwise find expression. Contemporary anxieties and dissents are here being reassembled, reassembled and represented as hauntings, shadows and phantoms. What is clear is that we are certainly very far from nature writing and we've entered into a mutated cultural terrain that includes the weird and the punk. Among the shared landscapes of this terrain are ruins, fields, pits, drains, fringes, relics, buried objects, hilltops, demons and deep pasts. In much of this work, suppressed forces um, pulse and flicker beneath the ground and within the air or water, waiting to erupt or to condense. Elliot O'Donnell's account of werewolf hauntings described features strikingly similar landscapes full of seams and gloomy slate quarries half full of foul water. Old Stinker is famous, famously associated with the ill-smelling Barnston drain. This drain runs through derelict factory and industrial sites, as well as along the edges of two graveyards. It's also, it also has a macabre reputation because of supposed accidental drownings in the heavily polluted water and as the site of murders and suicides. This werewolf is firmly situated within the English Erie and as such represents suppressed forces. Taken together in all its variety, this movement suggests what the writer and archaeologist Eddie Proctor recently called a new landscape aesthetic. And there are increasingly numbers of writers, artists and filmmakers who are reinvesting the landscape with esoteric and mythical imagery, which I think articulates pressing contemporary concerns. So what are the sources of this unsettlement? Clearly, the, the recent rise of the Erie coincides with an era of late capitalism and a phase of severe environmental damage. This is the climate in which the spectre of the whole werewolf has re-emerged, rising from the ashes of the flesh and blood wolf. New sightings of the whole werewolf began to appear in 2015. The reappearance of this English werewolf coincided with new debates about the rewilding of the wolf in the UK. The myth of the last wolf and the possibility of rewilding large species in Britain, including wolves and lynx. Research groups within the academy had also begun to openly question what would happen if wolves returned to our forests. Interestingly, the reintroduction of wolves has since been seen by many as a symbolic process of atonement for the sin of the destruction of wild environments and the eradication of species due to human wrongdoing. This acknowledgement of guilt is linked to the rise of Old Stinker, to which I again turn. 
The emergence of the whole werewolf of Stinker has replaced debates about the werewolf's relationship to the flesh and blood wolf, inhabiting as it does a landscape which saw some of the last wolves in England. The reappearance of old Stinker in Hull in the present could not be more significant. He represents not only our belief in him as a supernatural shapeshifter, but our collective guilt at the extinction of an entire indigenous species of wolf. My instincts are to embrace the myth and to see it as a manifestation of our cultural memory around wolves. There exists a tension between what is recorded by historians and what subsists within a culture's collective memory. The collective memory is supposedly stored in the literary cultural. I've argued then that the violence of the English countryside, the English era, the era of late capitalism, and our cultural memory around what humans did to wolves have combined in the myth of old stinker. And to quote Catherine Hughes, alluding to the Guardian, sorry, alluding in the Guardian to increased interest in werewolves, in our dog eat dog world, it's time for werewolves. Um, so I'm just going to finish now. Um, so, contrary to the assertion of earlier writers, the old stinker story tells us that belief in werewolves lives on beyond the actual lives of the wolves that were thought to inspire them. Rather than being dismissed as a rather fishy tale, the old stinker myth can allow us to lament the last wolves to run free in English forests. As a werewolf, he's far from being a curse. In fact, he's a gift. He can reawaken the memory of what humans did to wolves and redeem the big bad wolf that filled our childhood nightmares and remind us that the werewolf is nothing more than the monstrous spectre wolf. Thank you.